Microsoft CEO lets rip on transforming the company into a super intelligence organization. This is a banger. We're going to build a first class super intelligence team. We're going to continue to drop and do on in the open some of these models. They will either be in our products being used because they're going to be latency friendly, cogs friendly or what have you, or they'll have some special capability. And we will do real research in order to be ready for some next five, six, seven, eight break breakthroughs uh, that are all needed on this march towards super intelligence. So I think that's, and while exploiting the advantage we have of having the GPT family that we can work on top of as well. Mm. Say we roll forward seven years, uh, you no longer have access to OpenAI models. What does one get confidence or what does Microsoft do to make sure they are leading uh, have a leading AI lab, right? Today, you know, it's, it's all open AI has developed many of the breakthroughs, whether it be scaling or reasoning or Google's developed all the breakthroughs like transformers. Uh, but but it, it is also a big talent game, right? You know, you've seen Meta spend, you know, north of $20 billion on talent, right? Uh, you've seen Anthropic uh, poach the entire Blue Shift reasoning team from Google last year. You've seen Meta poach a large reasoning and post-training team from Google more recently. These, these sorts of talent wars are very capital intensive. They're the ones that, you know, arguably, you know, if you're spending $100 billion on infrastructure, you should also spend, you know, X amount of money on, on the people using the infrastructure so that they're more efficiently making these new breakthroughs. What, what confidence can one get that, you know, hey, Microsoft will have a team that's world class that can make these breakthroughs. And, you know, once you decide to turn on the money faucet, you know, you're, you're being a bit capital efficient right now, which is, which is smart, it seems, uh, to not waste money to doing duplicative work. But once you decide you need to, you know, how, how can one say, oh, yeah, now you can shoot up to where the, top five model. Oh, look, I mean, at the, at the end of the day, we are going to build a world-class team and we are already have a world-class team that's beginning to be sort of assembled, right? With Mustafa coming in, we have Karen, we have Amar Subramanian, who did a lot of the post-training at Gemini, 2.5, who's at Microsoft, Nando, who did a lot of the multimedia work at DeepMind is there. And so we're going to build a world-class team. And in fact, I think later this week, even Mustafa will publish some, you know, a little more clarity on what our lab is going to go do. Um, I think the thing that I want uh, the world to know, perhaps, uh, is we are going to build the infrastructure that will support multiple models. Uh, you know, uh, we, because from a hyperscale perspective, we want to build the most scaled infrastructure fleet that's capable of supporting all the models the world needs, whether it's from open source or whether it's obviously from open AI and others. And so that's kind of one job. Second is in our own model capability, we will absolutely use the open AI model in our products and we will start building our own models. And we may like in, in GitHub Copilot, Anthropic is used. So we will even have other frontier models that are going to be wrapped into our products as well. So I think that that's kind of how at least each time, at the end of the day, the eval of the product as it meets a particular task or a job is what matters. And we'll sort of back from there into the vertical integration needed, uh, knowing that as long as you're, service, you know, you're serving the market well with the product, you can always cost optimize. Mm. There's a question going forward. So right now we have models that have this distinction between training and inference. And one could argue that there's like a smaller and smaller difference between the different models. Um, going forward, if you're really expecting something like human level intelligence, humans learn on the job. You know, if you think about your last 30 years, what, what makes Satya token so valuable? It's the last 30 years of wisdom and experience you've gained at Microsoft. Um, and we will eventually have models if they get to human level, which will have this ability to continuously learn on the job. And that will drive so much value to the model company that is ahead, at least in my view, because you have copies of one model broadly deployed through the economy, learning how to do every single job. And unlike humans, they can amalgamate their learnings to that model. So there's this sort of continuous learning sort of exponential feedback loop, um, which almost looks like a sort of intelligence explosion. Microsoft is building a world-class super intelligence team while spending hundreds of billions on infrastructure because where models can continuously learn on the job across millions of deployments, being the leading model company becomes existentially important rather than just your preference of swapping in one model for another. Leading AI companies must make massive commitments to both infrastructure and talent simultaneously, with Meta, for example, spending north of $20 billion on talent alone and infrastructure investments reaching $100 billion. These aren't optional expenses, but existential requirements for staying competitive. This is a bet the company moment for every major tech player. 
You can't half commit to AI. You either go all in on both infrastructure and talent, or you fall irreversibly behind. The scale of investment required eliminates most potential competitors before they can even start. Spending $100 billion on infrastructure is no joke. And that's what it takes to build the compute capacity for training and running frontier models at scale. Data centers, GPUs, networking, power infrastructure. But Microsoft CEO's point is that you can't just build infrastructure and hope it generates breakthroughs. You need elite efficiency using that infrastructure to create the algorithmic innovations that matter. Meta's $20 billion on talent shows how expensive the human capital side has become. These are no longer normal engineer salaries. They're packages designed to poach the best researchers from competitors. For example, Anthropic has been raiding Google's entire reasoning team and Meta poaches post-training experts. They're paying whatever it takes because a handful of key people can create breakthroughs worth billions. These capital-intensive talent wars create winner-takes-most dynamics. If you're willing to spend $20 billion on talent and competitors aren't, you're going to get more than your fair share of the best people. And those people will make breakthroughs faster and those breakthroughs will attract more talent who want to work on the cutting edge tech. And that talent gap compounds just like the infrastructure gap. The infrastructure talent pairing is critical because they compound each other. Great infrastructure without great talent means you're just burning electricity. Great talent without infrastructure means your researchers can't train models at competitive scale. You need both firing simultaneously to stay in the race. And in that talent war, individual AI researchers can shift the entire competitive landscape. AI isn't like traditional software where you can hire 100 decent engineers to replace 10 great ones. In the frontier AI research, specific individuals or small teams create the breakthroughs that define competitive advantages. Losing or gaining these people changes everything. For example, Anthrotic poached Google's entire blue shift reasoning team. And when they did that, they didn't just get employees, they got the accumulated knowledge, intuition, and relationships that created Google's reasoning capabilities. That team knows what approach failed, what worked, what the next promising directions are. That institutional knowledge can't be easily rebuilt. If hiring one researcher or one team of researchers gives you two to three years of competitive advantage in a market worth hundreds of billions of dollars, paying 50 million or 100 million in total comp for that person is incredibly cheap. The ROI of elite AI talent is unprecedented compared to any other field. But what's also interesting is the talent wars aren't zero sum, they're negative sum for the losers. If you have some of your best talent poached, you lose capability while competitors gain it simultaneously. This is the nightmare scenario for AI labs. You're not just falling behind, but if you lose talent, you're actively empowering your competitors with your own hard won knowledge. This explains the extreme defensiveness around top talent and why companies will pay almost anything to retain key researchers. Losing one critical team doesn't just slow down your progress by let's say 12 months, it might accelerate your competitor by 24 months while setting you back. It could be a year or two swing in competitive positioning from a single talent loss. In a race where being six months behind might mean permanent second place status, these talent moves can be company defining. Picture this, a potential client searches for what your business offers and your YouTube video appears. Before they've even booked a call, they've built trust with you, turning them into a warm lead. That's why our clients are hitting $100,000 months because YouTube turns attention into authority. If you run a business, book a call and I'll show you exactly how to make this happen.